Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, uh, welcome to the ICTS Distinguished Lecture by Professor Carlton Caves. Uh, the ICTS Distinguished Lecture is a very special, uh, one of our very special lectures that we host here at ICTS. Uh, it's often part of a program, uh, and uh, it's delivered by a long list of eminent scientists. It has been delivered by a long, uh, these lectures have been delivered by a long list of scientists. So you'll find all the past uh, distinguished lectures. I just, I think the one of the recent ones was Giorgio Parisi and uh, and uh, various other uh, luminaries from the past. Uh, so uh, uh, so th this uh, is uh, the idea is uh, to have the lecture at a scientific colloquium level, uh, sort of accessible to a slightly broader audience. And uh, I'm very happy that Professor Dalton Caves accepted our invitation. Uh, to give such a lecture in, as part of this meeting. Uh, so um, I will now hand it over to uh, Professor Anil Shaji to give an introduction to the speaker and proceed with the... Uh, thank you, Professor Rajesh, and thank you, ICTS, for um, hosting this distinguished lecture by uh, Professor Carl Caves. Uh, uh, we should uh, start by saying that I was indeed extremely fortunate to be Carl's uh, postdoc for a period of around four years, the time of the, uh, uh, in 2004 to 2009. So, uh, it was definitely one of the biggest influences in my scientific career. And it, I'm extremely grateful that Carl um, accepted our request be part of the school and also ICTS facilitated this uh, special uh, distinguished lecture, which I think is definitely befitting honor to a person whose discoveries back in the 80s actually formed the basis of this entire school. That discovery of that quantum mechanics can play a role in doing better measurements, precision measurements, uh, that squeezing the light in an input port of an interferometer makes such a big difference. And Carl talk, and you all got uh, the good fortune of uh, hearing it direct from the horse's mouth in the sense that Carl told you about how those uh, photons were special and it let you do things that you otherwise would not hope to do and including all the excitement about, around detecting gravitational waves and so on, and seeing the universe in an entirely new way. So just a, to a background, uh, Professor Caves did his, uh, is originally from Oklahoma in the USA. Uh, he did his undergraduate in Rice University in Houston, and then proceeded to the uh, California Institute of Technology, as he told me, in search of options with respect to studying general theory of relativity. Um, um, and um, was a, uh, uh, did his graduate studies with uh, uh, Professor Kip Thorne, who also incidentally has given a distinguished lecture here. So in that uh, collage of posters, you could see Kip Thorne's picture. So now next year in the collage, you can have Kip Thorne and Carl Case also together as distinguished speakers at ICTS. And uh, he continued there as a uh, research faculty for a while longer, and I believe there was a short stint at the University of Southern California, following which uh, uh, Carl moved to the University of New Mexico at uh, Albuquerque, uh, um, and had a very long and illustrious career there, and still continues to be there, although officially retired and the emeritus professor there. Uh, he was uh, the uh, director of the Center for Quantum Information, which is uh, at uh, UNM, which is actually a, a center that uh, spans across multiple, uh, of multiple uh, universities, including University of uh, Arizona and few other uh, places. Um, he has a, a long list of uh, very active and distinguished uh, students uh, who are in the broad field of quantum information, quantum technology, uh, uh, precision sensing, and so on. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, he has also uh, 
uh, been recognized for his stellar contributions to various aspects of uh, uh, the foundations of uh, measurement uh, theory and the whole point of information and so on. And as Carl would put it in his uh, talk, which I think he told us also, uh, converting uh, quantum mechanics uh, from being something that's restrictive to something that's uh, allowing you to do new things. Um, and, uh, and those awards, including uh, the uh, fellow of the US National Academy of Sciences, and recently he was awarded, awarded the ECS prize from China, which I believe he has not yet gone to accept. Uh, he has accepted it, but not yet gone there. But definitely, so um, um, it is uh, genuinely a uh, pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Carl Kiers for the ICTS uh, Distinguished Lecture. Thank you. Thanks, uh, 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 Professor Shaji, for that very personal and very nice introduction. There's a small little ceremony here that at ICTS we have. I'll invite Professor Spentawadia, the founding director, to hand over a memento to Carl. Thank you. Should so, I put uh, this sandalwood? Oh, look at that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you would do me very careful. Ah, oh, yes, it would be good. <laughs> very classic. <laughs> Thank you. Hope it will find a place on your mantelpiece. <laughs> I reckon I will. All right, before I get started, let me just emphasize um, what an honor it is for me and to be invited to give this lecture. Um, it's a real opportunity for me to expose this audience to some very fundamental work that I've been doing over the last three years, and we hope I don't blow it. But anyway, that's I'm always worried about that. Uh, and I also want to emphasize um, it was an honor for me to have Anil Shaji as my postdoc. So thanks, Anil. All right, let's get started. I'm gonna be talking about some very fundamental things in measurement theory. It's almost certainly not what you expect me to talk about. And I'm gonna introduce it by this quote from uh, Heisenberg in an interview he gave with Thomas Kuhn in 1963. It's in, he's talking about a meeting, the first meeting he had with Einstein in 1926. Uh, and here, I'll just read it. Well, why not say that all the things which should be handled in theory are just those things which we also can hope to observe somehow? I remember that when I first saw Einstein, I had a talk with him about this. He said, that may be so, but still it's the wrong principle in philosophy. And he explained that it is the theory finally which decides what can be observed and what cannot. And therefore, one cannot, before the theory, know what is observable and what not. And this, is, this reflects a tension in essentially all of, uh, all of the sciences, especially in physics, uh, where we think we're dealing with fundamental law. We can think we've observed some principles about the world and incorporate them in our theories. That would be called analysis, trying to formulate a theory that encompasses what we think is possible, in this case, what can be observed. But then once we have the theory, we need to be asking, what does it say about what can be observed? And here we are 100 years after Heisenberg, really 95 years after von Neumann, talking about what can be observed. So I'm going to go through the history of that. Uh, I think this is an, a very important uh, principle. Uh, that underlines what I'm talking about. Of course, uh, a lot of people will say, oh, geez, he's just referring to Heisenberg and Einstein to make himself look good. But this is, this is, actually, uh, this is, <laughs> this is actually important. I think this is what, this is the motivator for me and Chris. And uh, for that, I need to introduce Chris Jackson to you. All of this work was carried out with Christopher S. Jackson, uh, whose genius and vision informed every aspect of this work. You'll see one more picture of Chris in case you want to try to memorize what he looks like to recognize him in the future. This is one of the first uh, of several life lessons I'm going to try to teach in this, uh, uh, in this um, uh, talk. 
if you're 72 years old and you want to be still be doing good research, hook up with a genius who's 34. Uh, it's good advice. Uh, that's what I did. All right. So when I give talks, uh, there are these slides supported by green, which show you the parts of the world I like, and they are meant to give you a break. So you have to, in this talk, you're going to have to pay really close attention. Uh, and when you come to one of these green slides, you can take a deep breath and uh, daydream for a little while and think about, uh, think about other parts of the world. So this is a cold part of the world, but I will tell you, uh, I never thought I'd be coming to Southern India to cool off, uh, but <laughs> I definitely am. It's darn hot, hot in Albuquerque right now, <laughs> uh, and even hotter in Phoenix. All right. So the key thing, the motivator for what, what I'm talking about here is the following. Any set of Hermitian uh, observables, and I listed the set there, they're labeled by X, can be measured weekly and simultaneously. This is sort of obvious. We do it all the time. And therefore, if quantum mechanics doesn't include that possibility, there's something wrong with quantum mechanics. You should be thinking of the examples of that that I'm sort of going to talk about are position Q and momentum P, the three components of spin or angular momentum, or two components of angular momentum. And just looking at that, how many people would say there's a heck of a big difference between uh, two components of angular momentum and three components of angular momentum? Nobody. Utterly, completely different. That's what we discovered. And that's what I'm going to try to convey to you. Uh, measuring two components is an entirely different ball game than measuring all three components. So the motivation is you can measure these weekly and simultaneously. Then if you concatenate, that is repeat those measurements continuously, you should find out what a strong measurement of the same observables is. A strong simultaneous measurement of the same observables is. And it does tell you that, except that it also leads to a magic carpet ride into a whole new world, a new fantastic point of view, a thrilling chase, a wondrous space. And now we bring that whole new world to you. Now I promise not to sing anymore. <laughs> not what you paid for. <laughs> but there, is, there are a couple of lessons here for all the young scientists in the audience. Uh, this is a love song. It's a love song to this work that we're doing. And if you, at 72, you can be passionate about your work. There's something about that work that's appealing. So think about that. The other thing is, this is what we do in modern science. Modern science constructs spaces. We get them for free because it's quantum mechanics. Constructs spaces beyond the senses by which we organize what we experience in the ordinary world. And what we do in the sciences is we explore those spaces, we investigate them, and then we bring them to everybody else. It's just a wonderful vision of what we do in science. You should be in love with it. And if you're not, you probably need to do something else. All right. There's uh, Chris again. There's the three papers uh, that, are, that we've written on this subject. Uh, and uh, if you, if you want to go consult those, you should just come up and ask me afterward. Or you should just put Chris, Chris Jackson into the archive, uh, and that'll, they'll come up. All right. Now, this is, we're going to list very quickly where we're going to go. It's a big, big, big agenda. And it's nearly hopeless to think that I'm going to get through it. And I'll give you a hint of why that's true. Uh, so of those three papers, we just got uh, reviews of uh, the uh, kind of introductory paper, which is 50 pages long, very favorable to review from one re reviewer. But the reviewer did say, uh, I think I could read these papers 10 times. 
And every time I read them, I'd learn something new. And by God, that's true. But that does mean that it's kind of hard to explain it in an hour. <laughs> so it's a big agenda. We're going to try to do it. Probably fail, but I hope you get the idea. So what's the agenda? Commutators can be ignored for what we call differential weak measurements. That's the key thing. You can measure anything simultaneously, uh, differentially and weakly. These differential weak measurements define a fundamental incremental Krauss operator, a differential positive transformation that's akin to uh, infinitesimal unitary transformations and should lie at the foundations of quantum mechanics, just like Hamiltonian evolution lies at the foundations of quantum mechanics. Measurements are not something different. They are just as fundamental as Hamiltonian evolution. The evolution of measurements, we call the measurements instruments. Uh, uh, instrument evolution is autonomous, temporal, and stochastic. Stochastic's obvious. Uh, quantum mechanics is a stochastic theory. Temporal, this is a process that goes on. A measurement is a process. It's not what von Neumann thought it was, something that just happens. Uh, and autonomous, that is free of states. We have a description that's entirely free of states. Third, we have what we call the instrument manifold program. Where, does, where is the instrument evolve if it's not in Hilbert space? Well, it involves on a certain uh, league group, which we call the instrumental league group, which is generated by the measured observables. We try to get that across. That's a tough one. It's a tough one. Motion of the Krauss operators on this instrumental league group is described by the three faces of what we call the stochastic trinity path integrals, stochastic differential equations, and a diffusion equation for a Krauss operator distribution function. I'm going to say almost nothing about that. That's the part that a theoretical physicist really is dying to talk about that because God, we really did something important and it's hard, but I'm not gonna go across in the talk. So I just tell you, that's what I'm proudest of, but uh, not gonna be really able to talk about that. Uh, we detach from Hilbert space by generating our instrumental E groups universally independent of Hilbert space. And once we do that, we have a distinction between what we call principal instruments where the Lie group where the motion occurs is low dimensional. We call those principal instruments, they're very special. Q and P and three components of spin are examples of those. And outside of those very special ones, the evolution is chaotic. And that's what I'm telling you is the thing we discovered that nobody has seen before. Uh, measuring, for example, two components of spin is chaotic, uh, as chaotic as anything as happens in dynamics. And we'll, we'll probably not be able to get to that much at all, but I'm telling you that's the fundamental distinction that we uncovered. All right. So this talk, unlike what you might have hoped for, was it's not about making about better measurements, but about understanding or thinking about measurements in a way that places them at the foundations of quantum mechanics. All right, there's our first. Oh, no, we went a little too far. Our first tiny break. Great place in California. You can see California condors from there every time you go, and there's only about 100 of them in the world. So it's useful to go see them. Uh, they are making a comeback, so maybe it'll be better. Maybe it'll be better in the future. All right. What we're going to do now is we're kind of going to go through 100 years of quantum measurements, how people have thought about measurements, and how we get up to the point where we are now. Uh, so let's go back to the founding of quantum mechanics. At the founding of quantum mechanics, of course, there was a lot of different ideas, key ideas that eventually got instantiated in the theory. Uh, Heisenberg and Born had the, their, the matrix, uh, and Jordan had the matrix mechanics, commutators, the realization that that had something to do with how you can measure things that don't commute. The uncertainty principle clearly connected with what I'm talking about. Uh, Schrodinger introduced wave mechanics. Uh, it was very quickly realized that the theory was properly stated in terms of the linear algebra of square integral functions. And the matrices were the linear operators on that space of square integral functions. Uh, 
all kinds of transformation theory. There was a thing called Dirac Jordan uh, uh, transformation theory, which unfortunately failed to realize that it's unitary transformations that are important. And they thought they only needed to preserve the commutators, and but they needed to preserve the inner product as well. Where did the inner product come from? Born, Born's rule is how the inner product arose. And you know that when Born introduced his probability rule, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, there's a little statement. Uh, he's writing a, pap a, pa a paper about scattering theory. And there's, uh, there's a statement that a certain matrix element is a probability. And then there's a asterisk kind of footnote, uh, note added in proof. It's probably the square of that. That's actually the probability. Uh, that's what he won the Nobel Prize for, uh, <laughs> a footnote. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> kind of a lesson there. Even a footnote can be important, especially when you're correcting a screw up in your main text. <laughs> uh, so Juan Norman took all this and realized the key thing was Born's probability rule, which said the inner product of these functions was important and formalized all that in terms of a Hilbert space, that is inner products in a Hilbert space. The important dynamics on that is uh, Hamiltonian dynamics, that is unitary transformations. And the measurements, Juan Norman told us, were measurements of Hermitian observables. Now, I'm gonna summarize everything. I'm gonna summarize the entire history of measurement theory by just showing you a bunch of circuit diagrams. So this is, this is von Neumann's formulation of quantum mechanics in a quantum circuit, uh, which I think is a really good way of doing it. So we have, a, we have a state drawn from a Hilbert space, complex vector space. It uh, undergoes unitary Hamiltonian dynamics. There's the unitary operator, H is the Hamiltonian. And then there's a measurement of a Hermitian observable X that Hermitian observable uh, has a eigen decomposition into eigenstates and eigenvalues. And then there's Born's rule, which says if we get result J, that occurs with probably a piece of J given by Born's rule. And then crucially, von Neumann introduced what he called, uh, what, what's called collapse. The state after you get result J is obtained by taking the state vector and projecting it onto uh, the eigenstate for the measured result and normalizing. All right, so that's, you know, you know, when I was a kid, we were taught the postulates of quantum mechanics. I think there were five. They're all in this circuit. You could just show people this circuit and it's the whole deal. Uh, unitary state, state vectors, unitary evolution, measurements of Hermitian observables. All right, so in a certain sense, von Neumann's, uh, uh, von Neumann's uh, measurement uh, these are called von Neumann measurements. Von Neumann's measurements were, was physics by fiat. You can only do this, and therefore there's no measurements of non-commuting observables. Because guess what? They're not in my list. They're not in my list of the things I just told you you can do, so you can't do them. Uh, it's a slight overstatement of what von Neumann said, but that's what everybody thought after a while. It's an example of overlearning, you know. Almost nobody was as smart as von Neumann, so they read what he said and they said, okay, he said that and you can't, you can't measure in non-commuting observables. We're also gonna have a little scorecard here for these ways of thinking about measurements. Uh, are these measurements temporal? That is, are they a process that goes on in time? No, and that's one of the big problems people had with von Neumann measurements. You know, Schrodinger evolution just went along, unitary evolution just went along smoothly and then whack, you have a measurement and it's all over. And it's just clear, that's not what a measurement is. Nobody who's ever a measurement, uh, made a measurement would ever think it's just whack at an instant of time. Uh, so they're, they're not temporal. Are they autonomous? That is, can they, are they free of states? Yeah, you can just drop psi from this diagram and, and they're free of states. Are they transformations? Yeah, von Neumann's, uh, projection postulate transforms the state from whatever it was to the eigenstate that you just measured. Is there a group around? You might, under, might not understand why uh, uh, this is important, but we'll see as we go along. I mean, I've already said I want to get to groups. No, there's no group here. The projection operators aren't, uh, they aren't invertible. So no way you're ever going to get to a group. 
All right. Well, after that initial phase, quantum measurement theory had the great desert between roughly 1932 and 1960. Uh, everybody used the Born rule because it's clear that was what you needed to do. But essentially nobody, oh, but even then, even today, people wonder about the status of the probabilities that are, come from Born's rule. I'm not gonna talk about that, but that's one of the major arguments in the foundations of quantum mechanics even now. But the key point is almost nobody bought von Neumann's collapse and they didn't need to because all measurements were actually von Neumann's indirect measurements and nobody actually needed von Neumann's postulates to analyze measurements. So they really, I mean, they were just ignored. The one example, the Stern gerlach experiment, which everybody in all textbooks is said to be a von Neumann measurement where you have a, uh, a particle with spin that splits into parts when it goes through a, magnet, uh, a gradient magnetic field. So spin up goes in one direction, spin down in the other direction. How do you actually make the measurement? Well, you tell where the thing is. You don't actually look at the spin. And when you look at where it is, it's gone. So nobody needed von Neumann's projection and nobody needed, and nobody was thinking about measuring directly on systems, even for the one example they could give of something that was von Neumann's style of measurement. Uh, and moreover, there were at the time no repeated measurements. That is to say, you didn't measure a system and then look at it again and again. It just didn't happen. Essentially all measurements then were scattering, were scattering measurements and you would make a measurement and it was over. All right. There was a huge set of mathematical developments. I'm not gonna go over these and all of these mathematical developments were very important to quantum mechanics. They were essentially all used in the unitary sector, but nobody ever thought about using them in the measurement sector. Chris and I used them all. Uh, and you could say that's just an obsession to appear to be big time theoretical physicists, but I actually think it's important. All right, so the desert sort of gave way by about 1960. And why was that? Mainly electrical engineers were making measurements that needed to be uh, described differently. They were effectively making simultaneous measurements of non-commuting observables when they made heterodyne measurements and they realized those are described by coherent states. So they didn't fit my Norm von Norman's postulates at all. Uh, and moreover, by 1985, there were beginning to be hints that you could make repeated measurements on quantum systems, especially in atomic physics. You could take systems, trap them, uh, and repeatedly look at them. And then you have to get serious about collapse because you observe them, something happens. You need to get serious about what that is that happens. Uh, and so during this period, people took advantage, uh, people developed what's called generalized measurement theory. And they all took advantage of von Neumann's, the hint that's in the end of von Neumann's book called indirect measurements. So I'm gonna show you a circuit in just a second for what an indirect measurement is. It's probably pretty obvious. I'll just emphasize that these are the people that I associate, especially the last three with developing generalized measurement theory. Uh, Davies wrote a very influential book in the mid seventies. Uh, Ludwig, uh, completely uninterpretable and his either postdoc or student, I don't know which, uh, Carl Krauss wrote a book that you can understand. And so that's why things are named after Krauss instead of after Ludwig. Uh, uh, Krauss was Ludwig's interpreter. All right, so here's what an indirect measurement is. We have a system, there's the same system we had before in state psi. Uh, we have a probe, which is in a standard state, we'll call it zero. The system and the probe interact, and then we make a measurement on the probe. And uh, we get a result J, which has some probability that I'll say a bit more about in a minute. And the system collapses according to the following rule. The initial state of the system and the probe is zero tensor psi. We apply the unitary and we project onto the result on the, on the probe. And this is still an operator on the system. Uh, 
and it is the final state of the system that has to be normalized. So there's some objects that appear here, which became the key objects in the theory, and they are the following. The Krauss operator, which is this thing that looks like a matrix element, start in the state where the probe is, apply the unitary, and then project onto where the probe is found. But that's still an operator on the system, and it's called the Krauss operator. It's the fundamental object in generalized measurement theory. How many of you are familiar with Krauss operators? How many have heard of them before? Yeah. Uh, oh, we, 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 what happened there? Yeah, screwing around. The second important object, although it's derived, is the POVM element, which is just K dagger K. And that is the quantity that generates the probability of the outcomes. You trace it against the state uh, and you get the probability of the outcome. And this, the POVM element has the following properties. It's a positive operator. How many of you know what a positive operator is? It's an operator that has no negative eigenvalues. Uh, it's Hermitian by, it's Hermitian operator with no negative eigenvalues. And it satisfies a completeness property that the sum over all the possible outcomes is equal to the identity. Um, and it's, um, so that's really all you need to describe a measurement. You say you have a, uh, describe statistics of measurements. You say you have a set of positive operators that sum to one, and that's a POVM, and that's the whole deal for measurements. That's what everybody in quantum information works with all the time. Um, the Krauss operator is a slightly more general object because it transforms the initial state to the final state. So it's a transformation. All right, now let's look at our, oh, let me see, I screwed that up. Uh, so the, the triumph of the time would have been to say, okay, now we understand that. We can prove actually, and this is what Krauss proved in his two representation theories, that all measurements are of this sort. So you don't have to worry about this model in terms of the probe. You just have Krauss operators. They act on the system to produce a final state and they generate the probabilities for outcomes. So that's the whole story. So we can just forget the meter model. So now there is one further thing, however, that's important. In fact, very important. What if we try to concatenate these measurements. So here we do the first one, and here we do a second one. The first one has outcome J, and the second one has outcome K. They each have their own cross operator. And so we can draw a diagram like this, that, uh, uh, and you just multiply the two cross operators together to get the total cross operator. There is, however, an important point here, which we'll get at by looking at our little score card. So now we're beginning to get to something that might be temporal. There's a process going on here, loads of different Krauss operators being multiplied together. Uh, is there something that's, is it autonomous? Well, that is, can we just drop psi from the description? Well, we can, we can just do this. Uh, and the whole process is just multiply Krauss operators together. That's what concatenating measurements is about. There is an important point here, however, the typical way people like to deal with this is to normalize the state here and then normalize it again here. That's kind of symbolized in this equation, but you don't need to think about that. This goes in, you normalize here and you normalize again here. And if you normalize at every step, it is not an autonomous process. So and to find something that's autonomous and independent of states, you just have to forget about normalizing all the time. And that's gonna be very important for us. This is clearly a transformation. Again, no chance of a group because there's the cross operators are not generally invertible. Uh, they, they don't have an inverse. Yeah, P K given J times P sub J. Yeah, yeah. so this is, you can always fact, take this factorization and you take this and factor it like this. And that's the sense in which Krauss operators concatenate when you normalize at every step. Uh, 
we'll say something about, uh, quite a bit more about that in just a second. So that was the second generation after the founding and the, de sorry, the founding the desert and then the generalized measurements. And then in the next generation, people started thinking about continuous weak measurements. Now I'm interested in differential weak measurements where the cross operators are close to the identity. So that's the example I'm gonna show you. There are other cases of weak measurements called jump processes that I'm not currently interested in, but you, you might be interested in, but I'm not gonna be talking about them. All right. So now we're, we're this is the last time we'll invoke a meter, I think. And what happens here? We have our, our system state psi. We have an infinitesimal Hamiltonian, where this is the Hamiltonian. Those of you who are really careful will notice that I've got a root d. I've got a root dt in this. Uh, I've got a root dt in this Hamiltonian, and you'll wonder why I have a dt and a root dt. And uh, uh, oh, I think I screwed that up. It's supposed to be a one over root dt. It's always a screw up in everything supposed to be a one over root dt in this because this is supposed to go as root dt. And those of you who are curious about that, that's how you get from the differentiable process that a Hamiltonian is to the stochastic that is continuous but not differential process that a stochastic process is. Uh, so that's how we slip that in. But anyway, the key point, this is a controlled displacement. This Hamiltonian is a controlled displacement of the meter position Q by the X of this system. So now you're going to measure Q on the system, on the probe, the meter, to see this displacement by X. You'll get a result little Q that will have a probability. Here's the same stuff I'm insisting here on putting the measures in uh, for reasons that I'm not going to say too much about. And here's the Krauss operator for the whole thing. Now, now we pull a fast one. Not really a fast one, but we do something that's very important. We take the outcome Q, which is governed by this Gaussian probability distribution, and we rescale it by a root DT on the top and a sigma on the bottom, because sigma's there, so that we get a, a scaled outcome, a scaled outcome whose squared, uh, squared um, whose mean square value is equal to DT. And that's what you need to get what's called a Wiener increment which is the foundation of the stochastic calculus and which is gonna be, it's gonna appear in everything we do. You don't have to do this. You could screw around and continue with Q, but this just makes it convenient so that everything appears the way it does in the stochastic calculus. All right, so there's our Krauss operator. It now looks like this. This is a zero mean Gaussian uh, with, uh, uh, with this mean square. And this is, basically the Krauss operator. It has an X term with a DW in it, and it has an X squared. All that comes from expanding this Gaussian. So it's got a DT term in it that goes as X squared, and it's got a uh, stochastic term that goes as, goes as X. And that's gonna be the fundamental object of the entire theory. Well, although we're gonna have to elaborate it quite a bit. All right, now I think we're gonna give another scorecard. Oh no, we're not giving another scorecard here. Now, the, the point of what I said before is we can take that, get rid of the meter, and we just write this. Psi is subjected to this Krauss operator producing this output, which you normalize, and DW is the outcome of the measurement. Okay, everybody got the picture? Any questions at this point? Is that, is that LX supposed to be normalized? No, 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 it is not. It, it's it's notation. Uh, I don't want to tell you why we use L for, why we switched for using L K, from K for cross operators to L. It's obvious why we went to L from K. Uh, this is the next letter in the alphabet. Uh, but for historical reasons that are no longer valid, uh, we got in the habit of calling these uh, differential ones Ls instead of Ks. So it has nothing to do with it. It's just a, it's just a cross operator. It is differentially close to the identity. As you can see, uh, this is all this is always uh, small stuff, and so it's very close to the identity, and so it is a positive operator. It is a differential positive operator. Now we just have to go and uh, start. Now, so nobody had any questions. Terrific, terrific, terrific. 
So now we're just going to go go wild like a theoretical physicist does and start piling stuff up, um, which is a technical term that I made up. We're going to pile up the Krauss operators and get a continuous measurement. All right. So now we just say we're going to make these measurements in sequence. Every one of them has this uh, Krauss operator. At the output, we'll get the product of all these guys and we'll normalize. And that's what a continuous differential measurement of X over fin finite time T is. Is this temporal? Yep. Is it a transformation? Yep. Is it autonomous? Well, if you normalize it every step, it's not autonomous. That is not independent of state. And that's what everybody else does. They normalize it every step and they get what are called stochastic master equations, or in this case, a stochastic Schrodinger equation. But we're not going to normalize, and that gives us autonomous instrument evolution. And then because we're just multiplying together cross operators, each of which is in a group, the product of them stays in group. And so now we have a group and we're ready to formulate what we're doing, not in Hilbert space, but in the group manifold generated by the measured observables. This one's trivial. Uh, that here's what I just said. Uh, we're gonna concatenate these guys. Here's the product. Every one of them looks like this. All the boxes are checked now. I'm ready to move um, because yes, 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 yes. And uh, just a second. And uh, this is trivial. These continuous measurements concatenate to give a strong, a strong uh, a von Neumann measurement as the strong measurement. That is to say, you will end up with projection onto uh, eigenstates of X uh, with probabilities governed by the initial probability uh, to be in that particular eigenstate. Okay, so there was a question there, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly, so now we're, we can take a deep breath and uh, now there's a question. Uh, so uh, is it a choice whether to normalize or not? I thought you don't have a choice. You, you want to get a state which is normalized, right? So I yeah. don't understand. But you see, I don't want to get states at all. I want to have a description of this process, which I call the measuring instrument. That is, I don't regard the measuring instrument as each of the pieces, but the measuring instrument as the whole thing. And I want to know what the measuring instrument does asymptotically as T gets big. So that's the reason I want to do that. Now, I will say there's a few people in the past who, uh, who did this and uh, who did what we're doing. Their names were Gutsch and Graham, uh, Robert Graham, who was quite a well-known uh, German uh, quantum optician. And they got their hand slapped and they quit. And we have decided to take up their banner again, okay? So you can certainly do stochastic master equations, and that's what everybody wanted to do when they did continuous measurements. They wanted to know how the state evolved, but what we want to know is what the instrument is, what the measurement is as these Krauss operators concatenate, okay? Yeah. Why are we... Well, I can always normalize in the end if I want. I don't have to normalize at every step. I can normalize at the end. So that, that's my excuse. Uh, so I'll use Born's rule in the end. It's actually called Luter's rule when you have uh, POVMs, but it's just a tiny generalization of Born's rule. So I can always normalize in the end. But if I want to know what the instrument is, I do not normalize because there's no way I can then make statements that are independent of the initial state of the system. If I normalize at every step, everything I say will depend on the initial state of the system, and I will not have a property of the, inst of the evolving instrument as time goes by. This is the key thing that we are doing. And so think about it. Uh, yeah, it's a vector of all outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say something about that in a minute. Uh, that's another important point, uh, but I'll say something about it in a minute. All 
All right. So now we're going to go on and do what we actually intended to do in this talk, which is to do uh, differential weak measurement of a whole set of observables beginning at time t. So we should multiply the Krauss operators together, right? And the Krauss operators don't commute, but they do commute to order dt, the reason being that the Wiener increments for the different measurements, the different non-commuting observables are uncorrelated. So the terms that don't commute all vanish according to the Ito rule. So we can just put them all together. Uh, we multiply them all together and this becomes the crucial object. Uh, and so that's the beginning of what I was saying. Commutators can be regarded for differential weak measurements, so I can combine all those things. And differential weak measurements are, are described by this fundamental differential positive operator. This is for one set of measurements of all the observables. So there's, if I'm doing n observables, there's n outcomes all in that vector dwt. And this is at the foundation of quantum mechanics in the same way as infinitesimal unitary transformations. So now I have in each step n Wiener outcome increments, and now I'm going to concatenate those. You may. No, there are various ways of doing stochastic calculus. There's a Stratonovich rule, etc. So what happens if, you, for example, I use Stratonovich? Very good question. Uh, I have to say this way of formulating things, it is a definite that the Wiener outcome increments are non-anticipating. That is to say, they are always in the future of other things they multiply, which are all in the past. And so you are definitely using the uh, Ito rule. The way this is formulated, if you hadn't invented the Ito calculus, you would have to invent it just to do it. Uh, now, there's some very critical points there that we discovered. God, I'm incredibly proud of these things. Uh, I'll point something out to you when I, at a certain point where we get to that. But anyway, the point is, the way we formulated the problem, you were forced to use the Ito calculus. Okay? How many of you know the difference between the Edo calculus and the Stratonovich calculus? Yeah, nobody. So uh, you can just, just believe me that we're forced to use the Edo calculus. That forced, being forced to use the Edo calculus means that all the DWs are independent of all the Ls that come before them in the sequence of uh, Krauss operators, uh, statistically independent. All right. So now what do we do? Uh, we're gonna do a continuous uh, measurement. We're gonna pile up these things, each of which has N observables in it. And we'll get this big thing that's all piled up by multiplying these together. And that can also be written as a big piled up thing. But now, once we get to finite times, we have to pay attention to the commutators. So we have to do a time ordered product. And this is just, you know, this is Dyson's time ordering. And we just have to do this. This is just a formal expression. All right, so the measuring instrument is the collection of these uh, time t, time big t. The measuring instrument is the collection of all these for all the Wiener paths. Uh, and that's what the instrument is. It is the set of all those things. And if I wanted to calculate probabilities, I would just do the probabilities at the end of this sequence. But in fact, what everybody, actually does is normalize at every step. And that leads, as I said, to stochastic master equations, or in this case, to stochastic Schrodinger equations, because these are all rank one cross operators. That's their rank one instrument elements. All right. So now what we've got is the evolution of the instrument. The measurement is autonomous, independent of states, temporal. This is a process that we need to analyze, and it's clearly stochastic. Remind me to say something about it. This is one of our, our proudest things to, to understand something about the Edo calculus that hadn't been understood before. All right. All right, now we're gonna, what, what's, the, what's the program for the rest of the talk? 
we're sort of you know through some stuff now that where you're just supposed to get an impression that we're smart and we did something hard. That's really the only part of this. And then we'll get to some examples where we can hope to communicate something. Uh, but uh, for now, so there we've got all those things piled up. These Krauss operators, that is the one, that the whole collection of those, they are all elements of a particular Lie group, which is the group generated by the measured observables and the quadratic term, uh, that x squared. And so you just start commuting those things and commuting and commuting until the algebra closes. And that's your Lie, and that Lie algebra generates a Lie group and all these guys are in that Lie group. And that follows from a thing called the Magnus expansion, which uh, was developed, you know, uh, at the time when people started thinking about time ordering in the 50s. Uh, and it's actually quite an ambitious thing to, to uh, muck around with with Magnus expansion. But it shows that the, all of these guys are in this Lie group and the instrument evolves stochastically in the manifold of the instrumental Lie group, which is the natural setting for the measurement. Now, I say that and nobody here has the slightest idea what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna to try to give you a little bit of, idea, of an idea now. So that circuit is sort of the way people would think about this. You, you do the first set of measurements and then the second set and then up to the last set. And you multiply all those together and they're all in a line and they're all in operators and you just multiply all those operators together and it's great. And I want you to have a different picture. They are in a uh, Lie group manifold, which I'm gonna draw on the plane of the board, uh, plane of the screen. And we start at the identity, that is no measurement. And we, then we do a stochastic path, moves around in there and we end up at the final one. So that's a particular path in the Lie group manifold. And what we wanna understand is how do, we under, how do we analyze that Lie group path, that path in the Lie group manifold. Now, you are of course wondering, God, when is he ever gonna show us a manifold? So I'm about to show you some. And we'll get to these a little bit later. The manifold for Q and P is basically a set of planes. In those plane, each of those planes looks two dimensional, but it's actually, five, it's actually uh, four dimensional because uh, the axes are complex variables. So there's four dimensional planes. Uh, planes and the set of those planes uh, is the instrumental uh, Lie group manifold. The bottom plane has the identity in it, the top plane has the coherent states in it, and we wanna shoot for those coherent states. And that's what we'll show you in a little while. Uh, for JX, JY, and JZ, I'm not plotting, uh, here I'm only pl uh, plotting the positive operators and they are a three hyperboloid of constant negative curvature. And so we'll get to that in a minute. And the negative curvature is actually an important thing in understanding the measurements. All right. I can see people getting more and more skeptical, but that, that's, uh, that's, that's great. So the heart of the instru instrument manifold program is instrumental lead groups. All right, now here's the slide. This is the slide that I would love to actually give a whole hour long talk on. This is what theoretical physicists do. It's what we're proud of having done, but that is, this is the impl implementation of what we call a stochastic trinity. The over, so here's a, that stochastic path. That stochastic path defines an overall quantum operation, which is a path integral over those paths uh, of the, actually the, uh, the uh, uh, what we call the instrument elements that are Krauss operators, O dot Krauss operators. Nobody knows what the O dot is, but that's where you'd put the state if you wanted to put a state in. And that's how we know we're doing things independent of states because we don't put anything there. The Krauss operator paths satisfy a stochastic differential equation. The Kartanovich version of the equation is the so-called mauer carton form, which has midpoint evaluation of the Krauss operator. If you calculate the Edo correction to that mauer carton form, you get the Edo form of the equation, which is this. And that's where, that's where the difference between Stratanovich and Edo comes in. And there's a wonderful piece of differential geometry that I'm not gonna have time to explain where we, we had two ways to derive the equations. One of them gave Ito, Ito equations. 
the other one we thought gave Edo equations, but it didn't give the same answer until we realized that it was giving us Stratonovich equations. Um, and then finally, we, def uh, we can define the, this evolution in terms of a distribution function, which is just integrate over all the paths that lead to a certain Krauss operator in the end. And then that satisfies a uh, Parker Planck Kolmogar of diffusion equation in terms of right invariant derivatives, uh, which are certain kind of derivative on the manifold, or the natural derivatives on the manifold. All right. So this is how we actually do stuff. But, you know, nobody's going to get anything about, out of my telling you how we actually do stuff. So now we're going to move on as quickly as possible. But first, we need to celebrate the stochastic trinity, Wiener path integrals, stochastic differential equations, and diffusion equations. I have to say nobody has ever brought these resources to measurement theory ever before. And we have an additional resource beyond what uh, you have in the unitary sector. Uh, because there you have Feynman path integrals and you have the Schrodinger equation, but there's no such thing as stochastic differential equations because you don't have a stochastic process. In essence, the way you turn differentiability into continuous but non-differentiable paths is totally different for Feynman path integrals than it is for, uh, for Wiener path integrals. All right, now this is the last of those slides just to impress you that we did something. And then we're going to show you what the manifolds look like for the two cases of interest. So there are two ways you can calculate the instrumental lead group. You can do it in a matrix representation, and then it is guaranteed always to close because the matrix representation, uh, if it's finite dimensional, can only accommodate a certain number of matrices before you start there's only a certain number of linear, linearly independent matrices. So that will be a Hilbert space dependent way of calculating the instrumental lead group. But you can just abandon that. You can just say, I'm going to calculate the instrumental lead group by doing, doing a, working in what's called the universal enveloping algebra, where I just do the commutators. The commutator is the only constraint in the universal enveloping algebra. And then you have a universal description of your instrument, independent, independent of Hilbert space. So we have dragged measurement theory out of Hilbert space and put it where it belongs in instrumental lead groups, which are universal and independent of Hilbert space. There's a big surprise there. I've already mentioned it, but uh, we'll get to it a bit later. We have universal instruments detached from Hilbert space. And here's the big surprise. Special instruments, such as measuring Q and P and the three components of spin, have finite dimensional universal Lie algebras that apply in uh, universal uh, instrumental groups that apply in every representation. Uh, but generic measurements have an infinite dimensional uni universal instrumental group. The instrument's evolution is chaotic. There is no strong measurement. Uh, and these measurements we call chaotic instruments. What happens in every representation is different. That's true for JX and JY. If you measure JX and JY in spin, spin one half, spin 10, spin 22 halves, all of those will have a different realization. Whereas if you measure JX, JY, and JZ, the same thing happens in every representation. You have a universal description independent of, uh, independent of representation. So what does that mean? It means these guys are very important they always go to a boundary of coherent states that defines a phase space for your system, and they structure every Hilbert space in which they are represented. Whereas these guys, very interesting for studying chaos, and we believe this particular group way of studying chaos uh, ought to be transported over into the unitary sector, and we have a whole program to study chaos in the unitary sector using the same kind of resources here, which I would be happy to answer questions about. Um, not that we've done anything. Anyway, there's the summary. Principal instruments, very special. Coherent state POVMs and phase space. Chaotic instruments, these are the generic ones. They have chaotic evolution and no limiting strong measurement. Uh, that's independent of representation. So there's a fundamental distinction. People have talked about measuring, and they've done, measuring all three components of spin for a qubit. Terrific. But when they do that, actually the same thing would happen. 
if they could do that measurement for any representation. People have also done measuring uh, X and Y for a qubit, but they don't know that if they even went to J equal one, something entirely different would happen, okay? All right, oh God, now we need a big break. See, I'm gonna to try to finish by in 15 minutes. Is that from saying the new? Yes. Do you think this program can describe uh, all continuous measurement processes? I'm trying to come up with counter examples. And I wanna see like if I have a clicking detector, for example, whose fundamental yeah. arc vision doesn't derive into Gaussians. Yeah, I, I, I would, uh, you know, I don't want to do jump processes with what you're talking about, click processes, jump processes. I don't want to do those uh, uh, because uh, there isn't a group you can get from them to these, but I don't currently see any way to get from these to them. Yeah. So, you know, that's a major admission on my part. And uh, 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 I guess the point is, I don't think jump processes are fundamental. So anyway. You, you ought to be able to take them apart. But anyway, that's all right. So uh, there is New Mexico on a terrific day, but then almost every day is. Not that I'm at the top of East Pecos Baldy, uh, typically. All right. So now we're going to do some examples for you. And these examples, they're non-trivial too, but we'll try to get to the point. So if you had been asked when you'd been told, oh, this guy's gonna talk about lead groups representing, uh, an instrumental lead group representing uh, uh, a measurements of Q and P, how many dimensions would you say that lead group had? Almost nobody would guess seven, but it is seven. Uh, so the way you get that is, you start with the measured observables Q and P, you consider their commutator, uh, and then you add the quadratic term, which is identical to the Hamiltonian of a harmonic oscillator, but it doesn't play anything like the role of a Hamiltonian in this analysis. It plays the role of a dissipator, and there's no notion of Hamiltonian in our analysis. That is, we, we, we don't have any unitary evolution because we don't want to know about unitary evolution. We want to know about the measurement, okay? So H0 appears, but it is not a Hamiltonian. And now you just start commuting these guys and the uh, Lie algebra you get is this. It consists of all of this stuff, one and I1, IQ and Q minus IP and P. That is all the Hermitian and anti-Hermitian stuff that makes up what's called the complex file Heisenberg group. Now, many of you at this point are, are surprised that I have these both Hermitian and anti-Hermitian things in here. But the point is, that uh, the I stuff here generates unitary transformations and those are a subgroup of our group. The permission things generate positive operators and those are not a subgroup because when they don't commute, they generate unitaries in exactly the same way that when you concatenate two boosts in space time, you get a rotation. It's exactly the same thing. So, there is no subgroup of positive operators. There's just a thing we call the base manifold, which is typically in mathematical terms called a symmetric space. All right. So we have this seven-dimensional Lie algebra. We, uh, uh, the corresponding group is the complex vinyl Heisenberg group crossed with uh, exponentials of H0. Uh, no, it's not crossed with, it's a semi-direct product. Yeah, well, we sort of had to make up, we sort of had to make up names for all these guys. If we just did the eyes, that's the Vile Heisenberg group. Since we're putting in uh, ones and Qs and Ps, in fact, they were there to start with, we call that the complex Vile Heisenberg group. So it's a six dimensional group instead of a three dimensional. And as I just said, the unitary part is a subgroup of it, but the positive part is not a subgroup. And then there's this other thing hanging on, which is extremely important. Now, 
So now we're going to continue. We're going to continue. So all of that's wonderful. You know, you can write down all kinds of blasted equations, but until you have coordinated your group, put coordinates on it, you don't have a clue what you're talking about, uh, nor can you do any calculations. So you take the Krauss operator. So you do a thing that it's, it's like a Cartan decomposition, except it's not because this is in a semi-simple E group, which is like a group theoretic singular value decomposition. And what is it? Every Krauss operator can be written like this. There's a displacement operator. And I hope everybody knows what a displacement operator is. There is this, uh, there's this uh, positive part, which has a center piece, center meaning it commutes with everything and then the part generated by H0. And then there's a second, uh, cross a second displacement operator, uh, which is, uh, uh, that's accompanied by the E to the I phi. The E to the I phi is irrelevant because it disappears when you take L, L dagger L or L O dot L dagger. But the, this centerpiece is crucial and it took us a long time to figure out what to do. Anyway. Yeah, so let's just, uh, I think I have a picture of that here, which we'll just go to. So uh, this displacement operator takes the vacuum and displaces it out to a thing with a, with a mean field, right? And it's crucial to understand that in our state independent way, so I've drawn these as blobs and the blobs are because in the standard quantization, uh, the coherent states don't have, they're not points. Uh, but in the group, in the group theoretic way of doing this is just points. And they get dressed by going to a representation. Of course, the point is there's only one representation in this case. So it's kind of nonsense to say what I just said, but still, I'm going to say, I said it. All right. So the POVM element that goes with this, take L dagger L and there's our, and there is a displaced thing that looks like an unnormalized thermostate, right? This, you can, sort of think about it like that. It's kind of a fundamental POVM. When R is zero, this is the identity. So I've written that here. And when R is infinity, this is the vacuum. And this thing is just a multiple of a coherent state. So the, and so let, let's just continue. So the coordinates are there, the center normalization in phase. There's what we call the ruler or purity coordinate, which turns out has purely ballistic evolution. And uh, then there's the post-measurement phase plane and the POVM phase plane. And the POVM fa phase plane is the one we're mainly interested in. And basically the evolution is, as I'm just gonna show you, is uh, uh, you go from R equals zero, which is the identity to R equal infinity, where where you're at coherent states, and that's what the instrument does. That's how we know this instrument measures coherent states asymptotically. All right. Now, what I'm hiding from you, and will continue to hide from you, is this center term here is a terrible nuisance. It's either a terrible nuisance or an opportunity, and we haven't quite realized what the opportunity is, but uh, we know how to handle it, and I'm not going to talk about it anymore. All right, so here's a kind of picture for that. Um, I said, we're gonna get rid of the center coordinates. We're left with five coordinates, the ruler and the two phase plane coordinates. And the two complex coordinates, I'm just gonna draw as axes uh, as though they were real coordinates. Uh, and this is R equals zero. And along this line is the identity. Uh, along the beta equal alpha line is the identity and the cross operator density it starts out as a uniform distribution on the two plane defined by this line. It's actually a two plane. And the evolution is move up in planes that look like this. So at, at a time T, you've moved up here and the cross operator, uh, cross operator density is a Gaussian uniform along this direction and uh, a Gaussian about this direction with the width of that Gaussian given by this formula here. And as T goes to infinity, you spread over the entirety of both planes and you're uniform in alpha. So you approach coherent states uh, uh, uniformly in the limit. So that's what you, you can say you measure. 
right, now there's a lot covered up when I draw this picture, a huge amount of analysis. Otherwise we could have, uh, well, and the referee of one of our papers said, you need to give a simple model of what you're doing. And this is the simple model and it isn't even right. It's not even close to right. So the, the other 50 pages of the paper are to get it right. Yeah. I didn't actually, uh, be, the, the, uh, these look exactly the same. And the only difference is what the Krauss operator density looks like up here. And this is the description of what it looks like up here. It's a Gaussian about, I probably should have drawn a picture face on where the, this line and there's a Gaussian about that line. Whereas down here, there's no Gaussian. It's basically a delta function on this line. So it starts as a delta function on that line and spreads out about that line. That's the whole evolution. That's what happens in these measurements. All right. This is actually hard, uh, as it turns out. And it's far easier to think about the other example, which is the three components of, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, that's what I just said. So I'm gonna, all right, I think we're in good shape. All right. Now we're gonna do what we call the isotropic spin measurement, which is to measure all three components of angular momentum. There's the commutators. The quadratic term in this case is, whoa, terrific, J squared. And that's the Casimir invariant. It's just a multiple of the identity and all representations commutes with everything. So adding it on doesn't do anything. And the instrumental Lie group is, uh, the Lie algebra is all the Hermitian and anti-Hermitian generators involving angular momentum plus J squared, which is just the identity. And the instrumental Lie group we call uh, the instrumental spin group. Uh, it's SL2C cross uh, this thing that's E to the R identity, okay? And here it really is cross. The, all, that, all that stuff in the E to the R J squared can use with everything else. Oh, Lord. All right, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, I'll just tell you what, we coordinate the manifold with, uh, with another Cartan decomposition. In this case, it is a Cartan decomposition. Uh, you start with a displacement operator, which will say what that displacement operator is over here. It is the thing that rotates, uh, it's the thing that rotates the state in the Z direction, the highest weight state in the Z direction into another direction specified by a unit vector N. And so it displacements, it displaces uh, the coherent state at the top to all the other coherent states on the, on the block sphere, independent of representation. All right, uh, the POVM element is this, it only involves this first deal here. That's what we call the base manifold. In this case, it's a symmetric space. I think it's A4, uh, uh, but that's the sort of thing that Chris, you'd need Chris to tell you, uh, the base manifold of positive transformations. The center coordinate involves ballistically. This is this thing we call the geodesic curvature. This is the purity because you can see that thing, when that thing, oh, we'll say something about this minute. Uh, and then there's a post-measurement block sphere and a, pre, and a POVM block sphere. So seven dimensions, and those are all the dimensions. Again, nobody would ever have guessed that you need seven dimensions to describe this measurement, but that's what you need. And the POVM elements look like this at zero, you just have this center term and at infinity, you get the spin coherent states generated by this process here. So now we're only gonna show you what happens in the base manifold in this case. The base manifold looks like this. It's a three hyperboloid. Uh, the this is the base manifold of positive transformations or POVM elements. It's a symmetric space, space of uh, constant negative curvature and it's coordinated by the radial coordinate A and N hat. So A is sort of how far away you are from the origin out here and n hat is the vector that points to where you are. You can't get this geometry right by embedding it in three space. You have to embed it in Minkowski space because it's a space of constant negative curvature. So I prefer a different way of looking at it where we just flatten it out and uh, here's the way it looks. So these are spheres. 
the uh, uh, unit operators at the origin at a particular A, uh, the, uh, um, the thing that looks like a thermal state is sitting up there at some point. Uh, and as we go to infinity, that thing becomes a multiple of a coherent state. And the only thing you have to remember when interpreting this three hyperboloid is that the radius A corresponds to an area which is four pi cent squared A. So the area of the spheres blows up exponentially. In the standard way, this is exactly what happens in a Friedman Robertson Walker universe in a space of constant negative curvature. And the other alternatives are in flat space, radius A corresponds to this area. And in a space of constant positive, oh, well, that's, Sai, you're in the way. Oh, there, I, I just disappeared. Uh, the area goes as four pi sine squared a. So you can see, you can embed this as a sphere, but there's no way in three space that you can embed a thing whose area increases uh, faster than a squared. So that's why you have to use Minkowski space. All right, so what does the evolution look like now? Here's what happens. Uh, we start at the identity and uh, the evolution looks like this. Uh, this is the stochastic path. It kind of piddles around the origin for a little bit and moves around a little bit. Very, very quickly picks a direction and zooms out to infinity ballistically. And this is another example of such a path zooming out to infinity. So asymptotically, you go to coherent states. The coherent states are at the boundary at infinity. And uh, uh, this initial piddling around is exactly what you would find if you had a, uh, if you had a flat space, you haven't yet seen the curvature. The ballistic term to infinity is a consequence of the curvature of this space. So again, you approach coherent states in infinity. And let's just emphasize a couple of things. What's actually happening as you move out here is there's still a little bit of effusion in the radial direction and a little bit in the angular direction. But the reason why you pick a direction and go out to infinity in a particular direction is the area of those spheres is blowing up exponentially and the diffusion can't keep up with that. So it, you just quit diffusing in those other directions. Uh, and secondly, there is a nearly ballistic collapse to the coherent state boundary at uh, A equal infinity. Okay, so that's just a little picture of what happens in the cases we can do. Actually do it right. We have to do a heck of a lot more work, but that's kind of picture. Actually, the pictures are not too bad. All right, so I'm just gonna conclude. The two examples I just gave you, that is simultaneous P and Q measurements. Uh, and for those of you who haven't realized that SPQM is a play on uh, SPQR, which is Senate and people of Senate and people of Rome. And uh, we use SPQM because we call that a tribute to one of the early workers on this who lives in Milan. So it's the Senate and people of Milan. Uh, uh, so P and Q measurements and the three components of angular momentum are examples of what I call principal universal instruments for which the universal instrument group is finite dimensional. They're very special. They approach coherent state boundaries. They're fundamental to quantum mechanics and they anchor our description of what Hilbert space actually means. All right. But generic measurements, think measurements of two components of spin. What happens if you have two components of spin? The quadratic term is the sum of the squares of, let's say, jx squared and jy squared, which is j squared minus jz squared. You start commuting that with stuff and you get higher and higher powers uh, and the algebra never closes if you do it in the universal sense. So you get a universal instrumental Lie group. The evolution is exploring. So you'll start out and you'll explore branching out into all these dimensions. That's chaos. The higher powers represent fine scale on phase space. And so I'm very confident 
This is the right way to analyze chaos. And we can translate it to the unitary sector in the same way, uh, using some ideas that, uh, well, for me, this is a sort of triumph because I'm gonna be able to revive some ideas that Rudiger and Schock and I worked on for a long time, 20 years ago. And now I know, and now I know the math for how to make them work. All right, so these generic measurements have a universal instrumental group because of the nonlinear quadratic term. They don't have a representation independent strong measurement and the evolution of the, of the uh, instrument devolves into chaos. So these guys are entirely different and they are the generic case. So in some sense, von Neumann was right that you can't measure uh, non-commuting observables simultaneously. You can do it here, but you won't get any sensible universal description of what's going on that's independent of representation. You will have to do every representation separately to see what happens. And we believe, as I just said, this provides a new group theoretic method for analyzing quantum chaos and dynamical complexity. So a huge load of things now there to dump on you. Some of you will have been interested in it. Most of you won't have been terribly interested in it, but we hope we have impressed you that we actually did something and that our program has legs. There is just a huge amount of legs. My legs, uh, is that a thing that ended to say your program has legs? That means it can, it can get up and run because there's just a huge amount of things we can do now because we now understand this setting for quantum measurements. The main thing is the chaos, but we also have a huge set of things to do just with further elaborations of slightly different kinds of simultaneous measurements of non-commuting observables. So thank you for paying attention for a long time. Well, as, uh, I must confess, it's a very uh, not difficult subject. And so I would like to ask you correspondingly a, 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 a very uh, difficult question, actually. And my question is, can you give a summary of what you did uh, for um, a third grader in several sentences? And maybe as, a, as, a, uh, as a, another part of the same question, uh, maybe for experimentalists, so what can I do in, uh, in the lab to take advantage of this great piece of work that you did? Well, my first response to that is uh, I, I might endorse the, uh, the idea that experimentalists are third graders, but I think it's nonetheless probably not a good thing to get out there in public. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm not sure that I have much to say about uh, uh, what it's gonna do for experimentalists. I do think that, uh, so I do think that measurements of uh, two components of angular momentum are things that people have done and they have analyzed in, uh, for qubits, where it is in some sense trivial because the squares of all the generators are the identity. So nothing ever happens really, nothing ever happens with qubits, they're completely trivial. But I saw a poster today where People are interested in measuring J equal one. And uh, that's gonna be different. And we're gonna go off and do that. Uh, and we're gonna go off and do J equal three halves and maybe J equal uh, two. Uh, to illustrate for us that every case is different when you measure just two components of angular momentum. That might inform experiment, I think, because people are gonna be interested in doing these things for debts uh, QDITs, and when the QDITs have an angular momentum structure, this will be the right way to think about it. So that's, that's my immediate answer to that. Uh, I think I had another answer, but I wasn't, uh, but I forgot it while I was answering it. So, right. so uh, 
in this uh, very simple case, you analyzed, uh, <clears throat> you wrote down this uh, Krauss operator. So I understood, is there some recipe of how to write down a Krauss operator? Is there some which? Recipe, I mean, recipe or what is the yeah, logic yeah. Yeah, actually? Yeah. I mean, I didn't understand that. Uh, yeah, so the way people, uh, I have to say people in quantum information theory, uh, the way most of them are trained presently, they never think about Krauss operators, they only think about POVNs. Uh, that is to say, you will ask, what's the optimal measurement for extracting this kind of information? And that will be a measurement uh, where you want to have a certain statistics. And so you'll characterize that by POVMs. And POVMs are trivial. You just say any set of positive operators that sum to one is a POVM. Now, uh, so that's what most quantum information scientists do. They don't really think much about cross operators, which means they don't think much about, uh, about uh, uh, repeated measurements. But the people who work on continuous measurements, they do. They have to use cross operators, although they tend not to think in terms of cross operators. They, they're using cross operators, but they don't, uh, uh, but they don't, uh, uh, they don't really do anything with them. But the way to generate a general Krauss operator, uh, a set, general set of Krauss operators, you start with, you start with a POVM. So a set of positive operators summed to the identity. And then you say the associated Krauss operator is just some unitary times that. And so the, that, that's, that's like saying, I start, if I started with the Krauss operators, I could say a polar deco decompose each of them uh, into a unitary times the square root of the corresponding POVM element. And the POVM elements do this. So that's the general procedure for making a set of Krauss operators. Start with the POVM, multiply by what's called a post-measurement unitary. So that, that corresponds to, I, I get a result of the measurement and then I just do a unitary, right? I just do that unitary. But, uh, you used uh, operators which create coherent states. I mean, those uh, you, you can, Heisenberg wheel operators. You could, you, or you could say, okay, I, 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 this is gonna be a coherent state resolution of the identity and this is whatever I want it to be. Now, if you have a measurement model, then what I wrote down is the way you generate a cross operator. It is need a measurement model. If I have a measurement model coupling to a meter, that is how I actually analyzed how my measurement works in an indirect sense. The cross operator is uh, uh, result of the measurement on the meter, uh, interaction, initial state of the meter. And that, that's, that's completely general for how cross operators arise. The important theorems in, uh, in generalized measurement theory are there's an independent way of defining completely positive maps. And you can say, you can prove that a map is completely positive if and only if it has a cross decomposition. And uh, then you can prove that a map has a cross decomposition if and only if it has a meter model. And so then you're finished. Uh, every, everything that you might think of as a measurement, modulus and little assumptions uh, is described by Krauss operators. I had a question from a student back there. Uh, yeah, I had one question. So uh, if I understand correctly, uh, you're starting with one state. Uh, so you, you're terming it as acting with identity. Sorry, I'm starting with one? Uh, psi states that, psi. Yeah. And then you're terming it at, as identity, then you're concatenating uh, uh, some Krauss operators. And uh, what, you are what you showed in the last couple of slides is that you are approaching some coherent state uh, Krauss operator, right? Uh, so like there are, uh, th there is one question is that, uh, why are you only, uh, why are you approaching coherent states? Are coherent states uh, very fundamental to uh, your, uh, what program you have? Uh, I think the right statement is that for all, uh, 
all semi-simple league groups of which we did one, uh, SU2 or SL2C. Uh, and for the nilpotent group, which is Q and P. So for these groups, you can just show that the structure of the generators defines an approach to coherent states at infinity via this process. So this, you can regard this as actually defining what coherent states are. Uh, they are the results of making these kinds of measurements, as you would expect. If you measure Q and P strongly, you should get coherent states. If you measure JX, JY, and JZ strongly, you should get spin coherent states. Um, and nobody knew the, uh, everybody knew the first one, but nobody knew how to do the second one. And, and we, well, actually, initially, Ivan Deutsch and my collaborator and some other people showed how to do the, the uh, spin case. Also, in, this, in this process. Also, coherent states uh, form an, uh, uh, an overcomplete basis, right? So they are. They are a very important kind of overcomplete basis, which is also informationally complete, uh, which means that the, uh, which means that they span the operator space. They are not, that is to say, they, any operator can be expanded in terms of them. And that is the basis, not the basis, that is the foundation for making quasi distributions. And, uh, uh, and some, one of our other projects is to lay out how in complete generality for all semi-samples, the co semi simple E groups, the uh, coherent states arise and are these over complete, informationally complete bases. And there is one fundamental a mathematical object there that uh, I'm not gonna, even going to mention, but Chris invented it. That's going to be the centerpiece of that. So if I may ask one more question. So uh, uh, now uh, you, you have given this uh, instrumental Lie group uh, uh, kind of picture, and there's already this Hilbert uh, space kind of picture we have. Uh, how do you actually connect the two? Because one is completely stochastic, another is uh, like, completely deterministic, right? So uh, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, you know, as I, as I already said, my hearing is terrible. Uh, and I've talked to Prasad a lot. And so, and I've given him tons of advice and now I feel he's cross-examining me. But anyway, go right ahead. Uh, ask that again and, and speak slowly. Yeah. So uh, you have this, uh, we have this Hilbert space kind of picture, which is completely deterministic. Uh, unitary picture, uh, unitary evolution picture, and now we have you, you have given this uh, this stochastic picture. Uh, then how do you connect the two and interpret uh, uh, interpret them like in this uh, in this your program? How do I connect the unitary evolution with the ultimate positive operator evolution? Yeah, yeah, that that's your question. Yeah, well, it's in the standard way that. Uh, when you select outcomes from a measurement, it produces non-unitary effects because you're selecting, you're selecting not just, you're selecting on Hilbert space, not just uh, rotating on Hilbert space. And then how I would like to see, I would like to think that I just get rid of von Neumann measurements and these guys are fundamental and I just use them. I mean, who told you you could use projectors to do stuff? I mean, there's no reason why anybody in God's good green earth would think that you should just be able to invoke projectors and stick them into equations. They mean nothing. So our things mean more, and I want to think of them as fundamental, and they replace von Neumann measurements. Uh, modulo this question that Ian asked, which uh, I don't want him to ask again, because uh, uh, then I'll be forced to uh, say that what I just said uh, is I haven't quite gotten that straightened out. Thank you. So I have a different question. This is a pragmatist's question. So when you learn about group theory and regular quantum mechanics, it's, it's useful immediately because it tells you the structure of your Hamiltonian and makes everything simpler in life, even if you don't really care as you do about really fundamental underpinnings. It's just useful mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. computation. And that applies both to uh, uh, continuous groups, that is, Lie groups and discrete groups. Yeah, so is it is that the case? Is there a way that 
that utility is present in this theory? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because what we think is that group theory was hijacked, was hijacked by people who only used it, and really this is Figner that hijacked it, uh, into only talking about the spectra and the way Hamiltonians are organized. And we think groups play a far more fundamental role in the dynamics in the way that we've described. And so uh, what you are probably thinking of as a negative for what we do, we consider, we consider you're thinking of that as a bug, we think of it as a feature. And I do wish Chris was here because Chris has better, well, you know, I didn't know nothing about group theory until I started working with Chris Jackson and now I, I know what I know. And, uh, but Chris, uh, if he's walking down the street and he sees something, there's a group there. Uh, so that's why we have a lot of groups. From a mathematics point of view, what does it give to harmonic analysis and non-commutative geometry? Sorry. From a mathematical point of view, what does it give to harmonic analysis and non-commutative geometry? You mentioned that in the beginning. Speak very slowly. Sorry. I'm saying from the mathematical point of view, what does your theory give to harmonic analysis and non-commutative geometry? You mentioned that. Oh, you mean the... all of those things. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Whoa, yeah, whoa, God. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> yeah, the whole, the whole basis of uh, uh, quasi-distributions and coherent states will be on the kind of uh, operator spaces uh, that, uh, well, let's say, so let, let's think about the operator spaces for SU2. Uh, the operator spaces are actually uh, the group tensor, the group star, that is, they're in some sense like the adjoint representation. If I'm in a spin J representation, the operators have all the integral spin uh, representations from zero up to two J. And that set, well, for SU2, that's the spherical harmonics. And all of the, uh, all of the harmonic analysis is uh, about what happens if you just cut off the spherical harmonics at two J. Uh, and quantization is cut off the fine scales and only live with the stuff between zero and two J. That's what quantization is for, uh, or spin and cut off the fine scales. And that's what we're studying. When we say that in a representation, these Lie groups will stop growing because they will, they will generate all powers of, of the uh, observables. That means they can't get access to very fine scales on phase space. If you do it universally, it blows up and you get access to all the fine scales on phase space. That is why I am very confident that the harmonic analysis will be crucial for studying chaos in the way we want to study it. Because classical chaos is projectivist infinite dimensional Lie group manifold into a phase space where the high powers of the, uh, of the generators correspond to fine scales on phase space. Uh, quantum chaos has cut off a lot of the fine scales, cut it off well, an infinite amount of fine scales and see what's left when you do that. And there's a very specific group theoretic uh, way of doing that uh, called Poincaré's fundamental group. And so we know how to do it. It's not that, it, not that the analysis will be easy, but we know how to formulate what happens when you cut off fine scales. And that's what quantum chaos is. So anyway, that's, thank you for that question. It allowed me to rant for a minute. Uh, there's a question from partial understanding of what you said. So here you're talking about a temporal process. Mm -hmm. That means uh, referring to your first quotation, which you displayed, the theory is saying something about what, what can be observable, which is a time scale. So is there a handle on time scale for collapse and measurement outcomes? 
Yeah, one of the interesting things about what we've done is there is a, uh, uh, in, in the Hamiltonian that we had for each of the measurements, there was a constant kappa with units of inverse time, and it becomes a universal collapse time. That is, whatever is going to happen happens in, a, happens in a few one over kappas. In the case of principal Lie groups, that is the ones that have finite dimensional structure. So the uh, finite dimension. So you will go to coherent states in a few one over kappas. So yeah, very important point. We understand that this collapse does have a time associated with it, and we understand what that time is. In the case of chaotic instruments, new dimensions will come flying in forever, and they shall have a situation like a Lyapunov exponent, and there will be other time scales that come in. That's a thing we have to study. I mean, when I talk about the chaotic case, I'm just telling you what I think will happen, and uh, I'm rushing. But, so, so, so that, yeah, so very that, important question. So that would be... Uh, sort of handle on testing this theory as well. It would be what? Time scales. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we would hope to find, uh, uh, and I'm very confident we will, we will, things like Lyapunov exponents, both in the classical limit where we do our chaos analysis and then when we project down into a representation, we'll find that there's a Lyapunov exponent which saturates at a time given by the dimension of your representation. Very confident about that. I uh, I have two questions. One is uh, when you say cross cross. I also gave RG the total uh, incredible amount of advice, and now he's cross examining me. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, first question is when you say cross operators are more fundamental than POVM, but when you write this polar decomposed form, you get this freedom of unitary to choose so infinite number of cross operators corresponding to a single POVM. So my first question is, what's your comment on that? Yeah, you could, uh, you're quite right. Uh, this polar decomposition is extremely important. So you understand this is for discrete Krauss operators. We could do a similar thing for the Krauss operators that we use in the continuous case. Uh, but it's always true that this is a set of Krauss operators by itself. That is the square root of the POVM elements. And this, you can always regard this as you get result J for the measurement and then you just apply a unitary use of J that depends on the results. That is, it's a post-measurement uh, unitary. Uh, so, uh, and, and you could also, if you have this here, you could say, okay, I get result J and I'm gonna undo that by putting in a UJ dagger. And we could do that in our case. Since I didn't talk at all about the post-measurement stuff, but that core, we could put in some feedback that got rid of the post-measurement stuff and we just haven't bothered to do that. And secondly, I have a naive question that uh, can you give a intuitive picture of how entropy is increasing in the system during this picture of measurement? Uh, yeah, well, that's probably pretty easy. Uh, uh, of course, uh, no, no, so let me back up. So your question assumes that I'm willing to put a state in, right? Yeah. yeah. And I'm not willing to put it in. But if I did put it in, the increase in entropy is the standard increase in entropy in a, uh, in a, a dissipative, dissipative or open systems process. And um, you could say that that entropy, I mean, entropy fundamentally doesn't ever increase if you have unitary processes. So you could say that's from the fact that all of my meters are entangled with the system. And if I retained that entanglement, the entropy wouldn't increase. But when I trace out the meters, that is, I actually read the results, uh, the entropy of the system goes up. So I think it's a standard story. Great, good questions, I think. Yeah. So I, Carl, I did not follow much of the group theory. Um, Sorry, Saikot. I didn't follow much of the group theory, but <clears throat> I have a naive question. Uh, does this formalism take into account or is capable of taking into account uh, measurement back action? If you have a continuous temporal mode excited in either a coherent state or a squeeze state, um, uh, and, and you have a detector who's um, uh, where you have a Photon number dependent kick. You're going to 
evolve the, the measurement apparatus and your, and your mode in an entangled state that is a function of what state the, the mode is excited in. Um, and of course, there is a time scale when um, that uh, or photo detector, that femtosecond scale of quantum excitation and the, ele the electron collapses into something classical that you've actually observed. But there is entanglement in between the measurement that device and, and, and the state you're measuring. Yeah, so uh, good question. Uh, I'm gonna answer it in a way that might seem sort of heterodox. You know that uh, in 1980, I, I and other people at Caltech wrote a paper about what we called back action evading measurements, uh, which were supposed to make bar gravity wave detectors work better. Uh, so I, I clearly believed in back action then, but I now think that back action is such a vague concept that I don't even use that word because there's really two kinds of back action here and I can illustrate and, and, and people, it, it's just impossible. So this could be a projector, right? In which case it's obvious there's a back action. I project onto J and anything else becomes uh, completely uncertain. Even if it's not a projector, there's back action embedded in applying that uh, POVM, square to the POVM to the state. But what about this? Is that, is that back action? Yeah. I mean. Sure, that's back action too, but I could get rid of it by feedback. So, you know, I, I, I just don't, uh, I've given up on making back action into a useful concept. Uh, and so I'm telling you that paper I wrote back then has enough citations, don't even go read it. Uh, Last question. Hi. I'm being slightly facetious here, but it is so hard to pin down what you mean by back action. So um, you have concentrated only on measurements, I understand only on the apparatus, but in practice, uh, there's always going to be some, some time evolution of the system. Uh, you're, you're not putting in a state, uh, I understand, but uh, in practice, always either the system or the apparatus is going to have some time evolution as well, some Hamiltonian evolution as well during this measurements. Is it possible to incorporate some, some of that during uh, with your... Well, you know, uh, we're interested in the instrument, but after we've found the asymptotic behavior of the instrument, if it projects onto coherent states, we can then just put in an initial state, it will get projected onto the coherent states and the whole thing's already done, the thing is done. So we're happy for you to put in, and you could have done that, analyzed that by putting in a normal, by normalizing the state after every one of our continuous measurements, and that's what's called stochastic master equation. And you get the same answer uh, for what the state was in the end, but you would not have a kind of global picture of how the instrument works because you would always wonder is what happened because of what the initials, where I started with the initial state, or is it really truly a property, a general property of the instrument? That's why we're interested in instruments alone. Thank you. So there was two quick questions from Sai online, but she sent it to me. One has been, I think, already answered. It says that whether you are thinking, Sai's question is whether you are thinking of measurement as a process, uh, which I think you have answered. And the second question is about feedback, whether you can incorporate feedback into the scheme. Oh, well, I already told Sai we could, so he's just asking me to riff on something. Uh, feedback. Uh, and this is why you should never ask two questions because everybody always answers the second question and forgets about the first one. So maybe I'll go back. And we'll, anyway, sure, surely we can, I remember Richard Nixon was on, somebody would ask him three questions and he'd say, I'll answer the third question first and the second question second and the first question last, uh, next question. Uh, he didn't answer any of them. Uh, so uh, maybe I should adopt that strategy, but. Anyway, yeah, we can certainly put feedback in because the feedback only depends on the results. It is designed, it is designed to take advantage of something about what you want the system state to do, but it only depends on the results of the measurement. So we can do that all in an instrument autonomous fashion. And we have some big plans to do Wiseman's adaptive phase in an instrument uh, autonomous fashion. And there's gonna be a big surprise there that I'm, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, 
um, but we're going to learn something there that's big time. What was his other question? No, no. Was, uh, whether it was a process that you had to think of uh, measurement as a process beyond collab. Professor Nikhilstein also asked the same question about time scales. Uh, I think I already answered that yeah, question. That's already it. All right. So, in the interest of moving on to the remainder of the poster program, which all of you are very keen to do, we will take all questions offline and let's thank Carl again for this wonderful talk. Or something very new.